It's almost impossible. Tell me this, Nehemiah. Is it mm -hmm. even even in 2002 when you're opening the Hebrew Bible and you're translating from the Hebrew Bible? What do you have to do? You're putting it in a language that I understand. And there are sometimes, say sometimes, sometimes that even in English you can't completely explain everything yeah. that's happening in Hebrew. Welcome to Hebrew Gospel Pearls, the special edition with today a special guest. That's right, folks, I'm here with Nehemia Gordon, who is Dr. Nehemia Gordon, but we have a real special guest in studio today. The man that actually said yes when we launched Hebrew Gospel Pearls. And who is that man? What is his name? Michael Rood. Michael Rood is actually in the house, folks. And so it's exciting for us to be able to do this episode with him here. He's been with us. And again, we talked about 20 years ago. And how mm. did I meet you, Nehemia Gordon? I met you because Michael said, there's a man named Nehemia Gordon from the Hebrew University I want you to meet. And I met you, and as a result, life changed. I'm so blessed. Michael, thank you for being here. Thank you for being mm -hmm. here. We're going to continue on the tricks of translation. Nehemia, the second verse, you, I got, do you know you let me pick the verses? Mm -hmm. I got to pick the I first one. I do know. <laughs> the first one I picked was on the double portion, and mm -hmm. we did a phenomenal thing, we were both surprised by looking at the big book, mm -hmm. using the tools, finding out what it says, mm. and, and be, therefore understanding what it means. But now we're going to go to a one that I think is a little more, um, I want to say the word, um, difficult, in my opinion. Well, before because, we get to that, can you well, explain what tricks of translation are? Because this is Hebrew gospel pearls, and we're going to start talking about a verse in, in the book of Hosea. So how, how do we get from Hebrew gospel pearls? Why, why are we looking at these well, you did a phenomenal job. You, you gave us the big picture. Tell us what the big no, no, picture uh, is. So, so well, I want you to share some of it because well, okay. you came up with the idea of tricks of translation, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful concept. Yeah. I got to be honest with you. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't ever tell you this. You know how we do confessions oh. sometimes. Oh, no. <laughs> I got to tell you something. Confession of the lips. So, so I did an SNL series. Okay. And it's called "Why Not Jesus," oh. and the third episode mm -hmm. is translators tricks. But I thought you okay. wouldn't go with that. So I said, I got to change it. The tricks of translation. But okay. what I did in that series around the name mm -hmm. Jesus was to be able to find out how translators make these mm. tricks. Now, we're going to do something special. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a third episode mm. on how we can get to the name Yeshua and how they use those tricks together. We're going to do mm -hmm. that. But again, why is it so important? Because when we're looking at the Bible, I think most people would say this. I think most people would say, would realize today that as a result of switching the language, or not switching, having the language of Hebrew, mm -hmm. getting it into English, there's going to be some what we call uh, inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I think I like was the, was the explanation of the translator is a traitor. Now, I want to I talk about that mm -hmm. for a second. Because it's almost impossible. Tell me this, Nehemiah. Is it mm -hmm. even, even in 2002, when you're opening the Hebrew Bible and you're translating from the Hebrew Bible, what do you have to do? You're putting it in a language that I understand. And there are sometimes, say sometimes, sometimes. that even in English, you can't completely explain everything yeah. that's happening in Hebrew. Well, there are instances where if you translate literally, you're actually missing what it says. Right. And there are many instances where if you translate not in a literal way, you're going you know, <laughs> to exactly. lose the flavor of what it means. Exactly. And that's why the Italians have this expression, mm -hmm. the translator is a traitor, mm -hmm. which sounds much better in- Can in, you say in, it again? Would you say it in uh, Italian? Because well, I love how you in, say it. In my broken Italian, traditore, traditore, which literally means that, well, what I'm told it means is the translator is a traitor. And, and it's a play on words because the words sound like each other, right? It's Italian, right? It's Italian, now, now, as far as so, I know. Now, I, I know we talked about this earlier, but yeah. you, you did learn a little Italian because you were at the Vatican. I was at the Vatican. I, I, was, I was actually in a number of places in Italy. I was in Ferrara. Ferrara. And I was in uh, Venezia, no, in Venice. <laughs> Venice, and then I was also in Rome. I've been in Rome twice. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, and so I, I went and I ordered my cappuccino, <laughs> por favore. <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, and when you know, I learned all kinds of phrases like "molte grazie," <laughs> thank you very much, uh, and that's pretty much right. the extent of my Italian. Yeah, yeah. Um, thankfully, most people, at least in Rome, uh, mm -hmm. understand English. Yeah. And um, so, so the translator traitor. There's, you know, there's this concept in translation um, 
there's a number of concepts, and they're somehow sometimes difficult to, to distinguish. But there's a concept in translation which is called false friends. And, and I think it's a great concept to talk about today. We have Michael Root in the audience, and Michael Root is a true friend I'm in. for me, for you. Um, I, I've actually known Michael longer than I've known Keith. And, <laughs> That's a long time. And I consider him a true friend. Mm -hmm. But false friends is this concept in language when you have a word that appears in multiple languages, but it has different meanings in those other languages. And I'll give you an example in, um, oh, here's a great example in between English and Spanish. Um, you know, I live in the greatest Spanish-speaking country in the world, Texas. You call it a Spanish-speaking country? It is. Um, <laughs> and uh, in, in Spanish, there's, an, and I apologize for the Spanish speakers because I don't actually speak Spanish. Oh. But in English, if you say uh, a woman is embarrassed, what do you mean? She's ashamed. Right. If you say in Spanish she's embarrassed, uh, embarrassada or however it's pronounced, you mean she's pregnant. So there is an, and, and there's no question that those two words come from a common linguistic origin, but they mean completely different things. And why do they mean different things? We can look into the reasons, it's a bit complicated. But the point is that this is a very common thing where you have a word that's common to two different languages mm -hmm. and it means completely different things. And they're not completely different. Mm -hmm. Maybe a woman gets pregnant when she wasn't supposed to be and so she's embarrassed, right? Maybe that's the origin, I actually don't know. I'm not an expert on the origins of, of English or Spanish words. But I could tell you in Hebrew, we have examples of that between Hebrew and other Semitic languages. Mm -hmm. And here's where things can get complicated, where the translator can be a traitor. So we have in Hebrew the word lechem, mm -hmm. which is, for example, in the name of the place, Beit Be lechem, lechem, house of bread. Mm -hmm. Lechem in Hebrew means bread. Well, the same exact word in Arabic, lachem, it's the same three-letter root, same word, it's a slightly different pronunciation. Lachem doesn't mean bread, it means meat. Mm. So there's an example of a, a false friend uh, where it means one thing in one language but another thing in another language. There they're very closely related. They're so closely related where there's passages in the Tanakh where it talks about somebody eating bread, or lechem, I should say, and it's clear in the context they're eating meat. Mm -hmm. And where, why is that? Because lechem means, really, if you look at all the Semitic languages, you find out lechem really means, not in Hebrew or, or Arabic, right? Well, it, mm -hmm. there it means bread and meat. But the primary meaning in Semitic languages is a basic food substance. Mm. So if you're an Israelite dirt farmer who grows grain, your primary food substance is wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're an uh, Arab shepherd who doesn't have, you know, out in Arabia, who doesn't have any um, land where he can grow wheat because it doesn't sustain that kind of, of agriculture, it sustains sheep and goats, your primary food substance is meat, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's an example of, now if I come along and I try to translate Beit Lechem, and I translate it because maybe I don't know Hebrew that well. Maybe I'm an Arab translator, mm -hmm. and I translate it house of meat. Yeah. Am I wrong? Well, I don't know. Beit Lechem might be a Canaanite name. And now we've got to ask the question, what does it mean in Canaanite? Right. Does it mean house of bread or house of steak? Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> Steakhouse. <laughs> Steakhouse, right. <laughs> and, and, so, and so that's where language and translation is really complicated. Yes. Yes. And and it can and, and it is because you have different languages with different meanings. There's a famous example of something we call lexical division. Mm -hmm. Lexical division is this idea that you'll have a word that has multiple meanings in each language, and in the other language it has multiple meanings, and it's not always a one-to-one -one correspondence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for there's a famous example is the word in Hebrew kadur means a ball, mm -hmm. but it also means a pill, mm -hmm. like a aspirin would be called a kadur but kadur also means a bullet. Mm -hmm. So the famous uh, apocryphal story is the Israeli soldier is in the bus station and he sees the foreign tourist, this poor woman, she's holding her head in her, her hand and it hurts so much. And he walks up with his M16 and he says, eh, what you need is a bullet for your head. <laughs> and she's horrified, she's about to get killed, she thinks. And what he really means is she needs an aspirin. 
right? So, so translation is a complicated <laughs> right, thing, right. and 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 then when you add to that that people have agendas, say agendas, Agenda. now it gets really complicated. Yeah. yeah. So I want us to look at the verse that you brought up. Before it was we your do that, idea. Oh yeah. Before we look at that, uh, one of the things that people um, and I, I, I actually. I actually have to go back uh, to our mm. special guest here, Michael. Uh, yeah. when, when I, 20 years ago, when I went to his apartment, he was in the back and he was studying mm. his Bible. Studying his Bible, studying his Bible. I call him the original Bible thumper. Thump, 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 studying his Bible. But what Michael would always do is that he would, he would always have more than one translation. So he would mm. always have, and, I, and one, one of the things that I really learned from that and mm. continually tell people, and we've talked about it, mm. even when you don't have the Hebrew text, Sometimes you can find out what the problem is just by looking at translations. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you have the NIV and the KJV, the NASB and the RSV, and you've got two, that's why, I don't know if you know this, Nehemiah, you never watched it. So we, so, so we, we did here at A Rude Awakening, the Jonah series. Have you watched it yet? Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> deep dive into the book of Jonah. Were you but in just, that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what we did Every single episode, 13 episodes, we ask people to always have two versions. And what I used actually was the, uh, was the uh, mm. NIV. I call it the nearly inspired version <laughs> and the JPS. Now, if there's ever a season two, if there's ever a season two, mm -hmm. those translations are gone. I'm only okay. going to use one English translation. What's, What's it going to be? The big book. Somebody say the big book. The big book. <laughs> Why? Because I'm going to be able to look and see and, and, and see what the issues are. That's what I love about mm -hmm. uh, what he does here is that he says that he based his translation on the best. And I want you to tell us why before we go on. Why did he say he bases it in 1853 on the best German scholarship? Mm. What what was what what was that? What was what was so going this on? So this is there? Rabbi Leeser. Is yes. his name? He Isaac Leeser. Isaac Leeser. And I actually hadn't heard of him until you brought, brought him to my attention. And tell us again what he did, because you learned something from me. Come so, on, so what did he do? So he is the first one to translate um, the, uh, he did a lot of things. Actually wrote yes. dozens of books. Dozens of books. And he came to the U.S. at a time when there were no rabbis who were trained in the U.S. If you were a rabbi, mm -hmm. you were trained in Germany. That's right. Because that's where Jewish scholarship, and it's kind of hard Isn't to, that amazing? it's hard to believe with what happened 100 years later, but the center of Jewish scholarship in the entire world was in Germany. Mm. And, uh, and also the center of biblical scholarship, mm -hmm. of non-Jewish scholarship, mm -hmm. was in Germany. Mm -hmm. And so much so that when I studied at Hebrew University in the 1990s, they used to have a joke. And the joke was that the, the earliest Semitic language is German. <laughs> and what they meant by that is, all of the great scholarship written on Semitic languages is in German. Mm -hmm. I had to take uh, Germanit la Matrilim, German for beginners, yes. and to get my master's, that was for my BA, I had to take Germanit la Kadmim, German for uh, advanced German. Mm -hmm. And because you couldn't have a degree in biblical studies, uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem without advanced German. Mm -hmm. uh, the other joke is that Hebrew University was the last surviving German university in the world. <laughs> and, and what they meant by that is a lot of the people who established the university were refugees from Germany, from Europe, mm -hmm. bringing over the German system of meticulous scholarship. So, and whatever you say about the Germans, they have a culture of meticulousness. Yes. So, yeah, so, so he goes so, back so that's to what say he means by he that. So he's saying, I'm bringing the best scholarship from Germany mm -hmm. to, to help me in this translation into English. Again, yeah. the first translation for Jewish people who mm. only read English. And he said, listen, you're only reading the King James Version. Yeah. And I want you to be able to read from from a Hebrew, a, a Hebrew base, but based the scholarship yeah. that was in Germany. So, yeah. again, 1853, real quick, Nehemiah. Yeah. And I, I'm throwing all kinds of softballs yeah. at you. But what was happening at that time? I mean, in, in around that time, in the late, late, middle 1800s. Do you ever see the movie The Frisco Kid? <laughs> you know what? Let me say something great about you, <laughs> Dr. That? Gordon. What's that? I try my best to, to catch you off, and I can't catch you off ever. You've got a story for everything. <laughs> you know, and actually, there's this and there's that. So tell me about the 1853 so and The Frisco Kid. So it's a beautiful movie, The Frisco Kid. And it's about this rabbi in Lithuania who goes over to San Francisco at a time when there's this burgeoning Jewish community and they don't have any rabbis because there are no rabbis, there are no natively trained rabbis in the United States. Right. 
So they bring him over from Lithuania, and it's his adventures traveling across the United States and uh, through the, the really the Wild West in many cases. And so why, why is it set in that period? It's actually set in around 1848, 1849, because yep. what happened was the gold rush. Mm. And people start flooding to California, flooding into the United States, flooding over from Europe. There's all kinds of persecutions of Jews happening in Europe. And all of a sudden you have Jews who are uh, coming over to the United States. There had been Jews before, but they start coming in massive numbers to where by 1875, they had to establish the first Jewish seminary for rabbis in the United States, which was in, of all places, Cincinnati. And why Cincinnati? Because at the time, Cincinnati was the industrial center of the world. <laughs> Certainly outside of England. It right. was the industrial center of the world. And a lot of Jews were involved in that. A lot of Jews were involved in the gold rush. And so 1853, this rabbi is realizing, okay, it's not just like you know a few hundred merchants who are based in different no. cities around the US, which had been the case, mm -hmm. right? You had Jews who were in, in New York, and in Charleston, South Carolina, but it was in the hundreds. Now all of a sudden you get thousands of tens of thousands of Jews who are flooding into the United States uh, to the point where there are famous stories that during the American Civil War, you had Yiddish speaking uh, uh, regiments that, and why Yiddish? Because that was the language of the Jews of Eastern Europe. And they were so fresh off the boat when they arrived in Kansas, they were speaking to each other in Yiddish. Uh, as they were fighting in the Civil War. Mm -hmm. So you have these massive numbers of Jews who start to come over. The really big numbers begin in 1880, but already by this time you have a lot of Jews. And the problem is, if you're a Jew in the United States, what Bible can you read? Well, right. the King James Version, that's right. what's that's available. It. That's it. And he's saying we Jews should have our own translation based on the most advanced and knowledgeable scholarship of our time, which was the scholarship of Jews and non-Jews in Germany. I gotta tell you something. I'm talking to a very dear friend. He yeah. says to me, when I show him the Bible, it says, Holy Bible. I think we have a picture of this mm. actually that was taken yesterday. It says, Holy Bible on it. And he says to me, it's the Holy Bible. And I, said, that's why I told him the whole story. Mm. I said, it's Rabbi Lisa. I told him it's first yeah. Jews. He said, does it have the New Testament in it? And what's the answer? Of course it doesn't have the new, it's right. the big book. But I mean, right. isn't it? The, the, right, because it's made by a rabbi. It's made by a rabbi. But isn't it interesting? In his, yeah. it's called Holy Bible. What else it's, should it say? And, and, I, and I hear this a lot of times <laughs> from people like on the internet. They say, oh, well, the Bible's very different than the Tanakh. N no, the, 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 there's the, <laughs> the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish Bible, right. which is the Tanakh, right? right? I mean, the word Bible, Christians don't have a, um, um, a uh, you know, monopoly on the word Bible. Exactly. The word Bible comes from uh, Biblos, which was a city on the coast of Lebanon mm -hmm. where they made the first books. Right. And it was called the Holy Biblia, the Holy B Bible, right? Right. right. But for Jews, the Holy Bible is the Tanakh. Right. Okay. So Nehemiah. Now, now for the verse. Yeah. Thanks for the. Thanks for. Thanks for that. Okay. So, so we're looking at this verse, which I say was complicated. It was complicated mm. for me. I want you to do me a favor. I, yeah. I actually actually shut it already. Can you see how okay. I shut it? I, but you have a printout. I there. have a printout, and here. I don't even know what it says. I'm you very nervous. You don't know what it says. So <laughs> what I want you to do is tap tap for us, folks. This yeah. is the famous tap tap. Give me two versions, any two English versions that okay. you want of Hosea chapter fourteen. Uh, two in English, it's 14, yeah. three in, uh, in this Bible, and I think in the Hebrew mm -hmm. text. So uh, 14, two in, in the stand, and it's interesting why there are different verse numbers, because well, the, the chapters were established by Christians, let's say out of certain books yep. that had chapters, but mostly like maybe uh, Psalms had chapters. Actually, you know, in some Hebrew versions, before the chapters were numbers, they were considered to be 149 Psalms and it was 150 that was introduced uh, in, in a later period. So in any event, chapter 14 of Hosea, oh, but then the verse numbers came even later for the Jews. <laughs> okay. You'll have chapter numbers, right. but they don't count the verse numbers. Hosea 14 to- Which version? This is, well, let's start in the Hebrew. Shuva Yisrael ad Yehovah Elohecha ki kashalta ba'avonecha. And then verse three, Kui machem, which means return, O Israel, to Yehovah your God, for you stumbled in your iniquity. Verse three, take with you words and return to Yehovah. Uh, forgive all iniquity and 
take good. And I won't translate those last three words because now we're going to look in uh, 14.2. That was three in the Hebrew, but 14.2 in the King James. Take with you words and turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so we will render the calves of our lips. Mm -hmm. That's King James. Yep. NIV, instead of the, we will render the calves of our lips, it says so that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we went from calves to fruit. Mm -hmm. um, the JPS from 1985 says instead of bulls, we will pay mm -hmm. the offering of our lips. And the words, the offering of our in brackets. Mm -hmm. And then the JPS says, I love this little note, note A, meaning of Hebrew uncertain, <laughs> yeah, which it. is kind of surprising because the meaning isn't uncertain. So what we have is two translation. Is it the bulls of our lips mm -hmm. or is it the fruit of our lips? Yeah. And we went into what I think, Nehemiah, I, I love the process that we went into. Yeah. I think it was, again, hours <laughs> of time where we, where we started yeah. looking at sources and all of those things to get to, to this. We're going to give you the um, the big book version, if I can, real quick. Can we, before me to, that, can we look off? at a few more translations? Okay. So um, Targum Jonathan is an ancient Jewish Aramaic translation, and it was translated by a man named Eldon Clem into English. Mm -hmm. And here he has, at the, it's a bit longer there because it's a paraphrase, but at the end he has, and may the words of your lips be accepted before you as bulls are pleasing upon your altar. In other words, the Targum's explanation and really what you see in the JPS is, I'm offering prayers, but I can't bring the bulls I need for atonement, so I'm offering lips in place of those bulls. Let me ask you a question. I want to ask you a yeah. question real quick. Do you feel like we can complete it or do you want to switch? Do you want to go to the plus or do you want to just go ahead and, what would you like to do? Um, I want to look at a few other translations before we go to the plus. Excellent. NASB mm -hmm. um, translates, and let me pull this up here. So the NASB of Hosea 4.3, um, or sorry, 14.3, mm -hmm. that's the New American Standard Bible, um, so it's 14.2 there. Yep. They have a different verse number, okay. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all guilt and receive it graciously so that we may present mm -hmm. the fruit of our lips. Right. So it's fruit of the lips. That's the there's mm -hmm. bulls of our lips and fruit of our lips, calves or bulls, same thing, in the other one. And here there's a note B, and it says, as in ancient versions. MT, meaning the Masoretic mm -hmm. Text, meaning the Hebrew Bible, our lips as bulls. So there they're acknowledging, yes, it says the fruit of our lips in, quote, ancient versions, but it is the bulls of our lips in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to read one rabbi, what he says. He explains what the Masoretic text means. Mm -hmm. We've kind of said it, but I want to hear what the rabbi says. And then we'll go to the plus version. Okay. Rabbi David Kimchi was a rabbi in southern France from 1160 to 1265. He's known as Radak. He, he says, and, the, and let us pay for the bulls with our lips. And he explains, in place of bulls, we will pay with confession of our lips. Mm -hmm. For you want words of repentance more than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. The sacrifices are not effective without confession of the iniquity as it says concerning all of the sacrifices, quote, and he shall confess his sin, which is a quote from Leviticus 5.5. 5. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, that quote only appears in Leviticus 5.5. 5. <laughs> he says all the sacrifices, but he quotes a specific verse. There are similar things in other sacrifices. That's a direct quote. Mm -hmm. So the, here is really the question that we're going to answer in the plus. What are these ancient versions that say the fruit of our lips, and how and why are they different? Yes from what we have in the Masoretic Hebrew text, mm -hmm. which has the bulls of our lips. Is there a different idea there, a different theology? Is there a different text there? Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting, the answer, because it's a subtle difference. It's a subtle difference mm -hmm. of uh, really um, one letter. In fact, it could be the same letters, just dividing the letters, dividing the words differently, but we'll get to that in the plus section. 
So, folks, uh, we've been talking about this for 32 episodes. Hebrew mm. Gospel Pearls, Public and Plus, one on the Hemia site, one on BFA site. But now mm-hmm. we are mm-hmm. AS after Saudi, after Sinai. And we're going to do something that we have just started this, this, with this series mm-hmm. where it's going to be on both sites. And you can go to Nehemiah's Wall, explain that to them really quick for those coming for the first time. Yeah, come to NehemiahsWall.com and you could get access to the plus episodes. You become part of my support team. You join and you can uh, see not only what we've presented here, but the second half of the program, which will be Hebrew Gospel Pearls mm-hmm. Plus. And you can get all of the stuff that we're doing with the Tricks of Translation. You don't have to mm-hmm. go back and forth. BFA internationally become a premium member. Those that are not able to afford that, we do have scholarships, but you have to go through an application process. We try to do the best we can to meet the mm. needs of people who, who are not able to afford that. But all of the information that we have, both episodes will be at BFA, both episodes will be at Nehemiah's Wall, and then we're hoping to do a third episode, which I'm very excited about, which will be at AL, uh, ARA, SNL, in the spirit of Michael, mm. sending it to the world. I'm very excited about that. Mm-hmm. Let's say a prayer. Yehovah, our Father in heaven, Avinu Shabbat Shemayim. Father, I offer before you the fruit of my lips in place of the bulls that I'm not able to bring. And let us unlock the key to what it actually says in the ancient Hebrew text. Give us the tools, the keys, the lock picks. Yes. Let us break open the safes that have hidden these truths through translations for centuries and get back to your original word. Father, thank you so much uh, just for history. Thank you so much for uh, the the wonderful way that you are maestro, Mm -hmm. that you put together such a beautiful symphony of ministry and and, and opportunity and of reach. Help us to continue to do your will, your way, uh, just the way you want us to. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you.